Hi, Steve here at BlessedHopeForever.com. I hope everyone had a fantastic Thanksgiving holiday. We've been studying together uh, in our weekend uh, studies, Galatians chapter 5, verse by verse. Um, and in our last study, we were uh, somewhere around the area of uh, verses uh, 21, 22. Uh, o foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you. We spent some time, a little time on that. A marvelous, marvelous statement by God the Holy Spirit that we ought to take note of. Uh, this only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect? Uh, that's a passive voice, by the way. Uh, are you being made perfect? That's You're not making yourself perfect by the flesh. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, doeth, doeth he uh, yet by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? This is uh, the Holy Spirit's uh, grand treatise on uh, law versus grace, this epistle. It is uh, probably one of the most neglected epistles in all of the New Testament. Of course, that's just my opinion. I hardly see how anyone uh, can, in this present day and age can read Galatians and not see where the problem lies. Uh, within this thing we call uh, Christianity. The Holy Spirit is presenting in the epistle to the Galatians the grace of God in contrast to works of the flesh or law. I don't have any uh, grand ideas that I want to push. I'm not trying to become a, uh, a YouTube star I do care about the truth of the Word of God. I care very deeply about that. The popular movement of the last two generations has been a movement of lordship salvation, uh, second works of grace, personal sanctification, how that all of that began is another uh, subject entirely. The popular presentation is that there's uh, basically three types of people, the non-redeemed, and then there's two types of redeemed people. There's the carnal and the spiritual which uh, clearly infers that Christ didn't do a complete work. It's been the object, the goal, the purpose of this ministry to try to make this, this distinction, to bring to your attention this distinction. It's an oxymoron, folks, to talk about a carnal Christian. A Christian is one who has been redeemed by the finished work of Jesus Christ. He's been made a new creation in Christ Jesus. He is not half a creation or a, a part of a creation. He's made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. And He couldn't be any more righteous than what He already is. I am not in any way suggesting that there isn't growth in a Christian's life. But dearly beloved, there is not growth in righteousness. There's not growth in perfection. If you are 
not already perfect in Christ, if you're not complete in Him, dearly beloved, you're not in Christ. If you are not led by the Spirit, you are not sons of God. The Bible makes no distinction between you know, good Christians and bad Christians. That is a myth even though it's been the popular teaching of the last two generations. Multiplied millions have bought into the Lordship salvation lie. You're redeemed, now you have to do something more. You know, praise God you're saved. That's a wonderful thing. Now, if you want to be sanctified, you have to well, you got to get rid of that, you know, pack of cigarettes in your shirt pocket. Folks, there isn't a, a carnal you and a spiritual you. That is a lie. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, verse 18, if you're led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. That happens to be a passive verb. So the translators 400 years ago uh, uh, put of in there instead of in. I, I would put by. If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And I, and I have no argument with your modern translation that probably has a, a by there. The passive voice would indicate, and, I'm, and grammar is so important, folks. The passive voice would indicate that the agent is the Spirit. The Spirit, capital S. So, I'm led by the Spirit. Therefore, I'm not under the law. I'm not under the law. I'm not under law. Any given standard whereby, you know, a righteousness is achieved or, or maintained on the human level. Now, I want you to go back to, if you would, go back to the third verse of chapter 3. Are you so foolish? Are ye so foolish? Dearly beloved, you have to study this on your own. This channel, this channel is no source of truth. This book right here is the source of truth. Not what I say, not what I believe, but what this book says. And I read, are ye so foolish? And, and I think that that's most of the people I talk to week after week. That's horrible. Where have we gone? In our Bible study. I think I've mentioned this before. You know, if you were to ask me to describe in one sentence the average Christian that I meet, I'd say he's a person who knows exactly what he believes and can't support it with the Scriptures. I, you know, I say that, and I don't, I don't get a lot of hallelujahs and, and praise the Lord's you know, when I say that, you uh, may be sitting there, uh, standing there, wh wherever you're at. You may be there uh, feeling dumbfounded. It just doesn't exactly cause Christians to jump up and down with joy. I don't know why it doesn't. You know, if you don't share that opinion, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. I do not think that it's great if you know exactly what you believe and can't support it from this book. I just, sorry, I, I just don't. Dearly beloved, I want you to know the Word of God. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, and now that's an, an aorist active. Having begun in the Spirit. Having begun in the sphere of the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? 
The being made perfect is a passive. Now that passive is interesting. If Because if the I there, it, that's you, is both carnal and spiritual, then it can't be a passive verb. If that's your flesh, the I of your flesh, then that's an active verb. You're being made perfect by your flesh. But the text is saying clearly, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, do you think perfection comes from the flesh? And that's most Christians that I meet. That's most Christians that I speak to today. I, I, can, I listen to uh, one individual whom I consider to be probably one of the best Bible teachers in the world today. And his statement was that if we do not obey the law of God, we will not be sanctified. You've got to be kidding me. Almost all verses that deal with your sanctification, folks, are passive verbs. You are not sanctifying yourself. You are not sanctifying yourself. It is God who sets you apart for His glory. Much of modern Christianity has caused us to so concentrate on the flesh, they have little awareness of the person in the work of Jesus Christ. Is it, is it my responsibility to tell you folks out there, all of you wonderful people from all types of backgrounds, tell you how to live, how to pay your taxes, how to live with your wife, how to raise your kids, or, or to preach the Word of God, which is the revelation of the person and work of Jesus Christ. People led to believe that their confidence is in the flesh, not in the Lord. Are you kidding me? If it sounds like I'm mad, I'm, folks, I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to really push this hard. I'm trying to blow this up, emphasize this so that you can see it so well. The works of the flesh, we've looked at them. None of them are good. And so we, we, get, we got down to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such things, against such, against such, there is no law. The text couldn't be more clear. You'll notice that it was works of flesh. You know, amazing how quickly the works of the flesh can have a result. You know what, folks? Adultery only takes a moment. You know... Robbery only takes a moment. Bearing false witness only takes a sentence. But the fruit of the Spirit, dearly beloved, the very Word speaks of patience and time. The farmer waits patiently for the fruit. You know, when he, ex when he plants corn, he expects to get corn. He doesn't, you know, really come back running in the house, you know, and... and uh, and say, boy, have I got uh, news for you. You know what came up? Corn. You know, he knew that. That's what he planted. You're no surprise to God. He planted you. If you weren't planted by God, you're not His. That's where it started. And you're going to Grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But, but you are always righteous. You're the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
That's what this book says. There isn't a, a second work of grace that makes you more righteous. There isn't a, a time in your life when you cease being a, a carnal Christian and you become somehow, you know, magically become a spiritual Christian. That divides the body of Christ, folks. It's because of things like that that we have the partial rapture. You know, it's, it's still a popular thought. You know, the good guys, you know, they, they go up, they go on the first group, and, and then the bad guys, well, they, they take the slow train. Not true. Not true. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The body of Christ cannot be divided. If you tell me that we in Christ Jesus have a free will to choose the walk of the Spirit or the walk of the flesh, I'm sorry folks, I won't believe you. Because I have to remind you, I have to tell you, bring you back to Romans chapter 7, which disagrees with you. You know, I was driving and, and I heard some guy on the radio, you know, say that the preaching of God's grace gives people the idea that because of God's grace, well, they can just go out and sin all, all they want to. You know, and I almost, almost went off in a ditch. I mean, I thought that kind of biblical thinking really went out years ago. You know, and I, I, and I just I wanted to shout at him. You know, hey, that's my goal in life. You know, that's I just that's what I really strive for. You know, is to just go out and sin all I want to. You know, that's that's where I'd like to get. <laughs> Folks, I don't know about you, and, and I'm being as honest, absolutely as honest as I know how to be. My big problem is that I sin more than I want to. You know, if I could just get it down to all that I wanted to, I'd be, I'd be ecstatic. And I am absolutely persuaded, 100%, that those of you who sin, which is every one of you, have within you a desire to please God. Dearly beloved, if your love of the Lord is not a sufficient motive and, and, you, and you listen to nothing else from, from here, this pulpit this morning, let me tell you, if the love of the Lord is not a sufficient motive, law isn't. It'll only lead to pride. I want to live for Him. It's not... It's not it's not as much that I love Him. The thing that amazes me every single day is that He loves me. He's not a God whose delight is in punishing me. You know, He's not a God who has a doll of my image up there, you know, that He likes to stick pins in. He's a loving Heavenly Father, He knows the way I take. And when He's tested me, I, I shall come forth as gold. There are no doubts. He holds me in the hollow of His hand. He bottles my tears. After He says, after I've suffered a while, He will establish, strengthen, and settle me. I am so confident of that, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Because he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that is true, folks, that is true of every one of you who are in Christ Jesus. I'm sorry, but I simply will not believe you if you tell me that you don't want to live for the Lord.
I think the greatest thing in the world would be to, to look my Lord in the face and realize that I am never, never going to sin against Him again. I believe that is the grandeur of heaven. And the wonder of His grace is that I'm going there. I don't know why He loves me, but I know He does. And I know that it, in, in, in every way, He touches my life. He touches my life for that which is good for me. It's, he doesn't allow anything to touch my life except it be for my ultimate good. Nothing can touch my life except it be for my good. The fruit of the Spirit that requires patience and waiting, it doesn't pop up instantly. The, the fruit of the Spirit, folks, that's what it grows. It comes, but it grows. There is a process. You may be impatient. God is patient. I'm glad he didn't say the work of the Spirit. It is the fruit of the Spirit. You know, and I think about that. You know, as we look at that verse, you probably don't enjoy it very much when he's plowing you. You know, because, you know, you, then he has to run the disc over that. And, you know, I don't know what all else. I'm not a farmer. And then you got you to gotta plant. Oh man, it takes a long time for fruit to come. And there is some suffering involved. There's weather, there's wind, there's rain, drought. All because it's good for you. Believe me, God knows what He's doing in your life. I know we, we always want to know what He's doing. Every moment. We always, it seems like we want to know where we stand in, in position, in relation, our, in our relationship to Him. The Holy Spirit, folks, is very precise in pointing out that our life is not a walk of works, but we live in grace. We live in it. We sing of the marvelous grace of God. How much of modern Christianity in these final last days has any concept at all of the marvelous grace of God, the wonderful prospect that, that we live by grace, not by works? We've gone through five chapters. We saw this in the very first chapter. It is so common and so easy to rationalize that we as Christians must do something. Oh man, we just got to do something. The problem is that Christian responsibility and, and, and that responsibility that accrues to us because we are members of God's family, the household of God, we are His children and since we are the children of His household, there are certain responsibilities that accrue to us. I, no one's going to deny that. The, and it's very, very easy to make the next step and say that, that to engage in those responsibilities is necessary if we are to be redeemed. And then without even realizing it, folks, we then insidiously add to the finished work of Jesus Christ some necessary work of the flesh in order to be redeemed. And it's easy. To, it's so easy to build that, you know, from logic. You know, it's human logic. Oh, but Pastor Steve, Oh man, you know, you know, one thing God can't do is force us to love Him. And somebody yells out, "Hallelujah!" Now, now, give me the passage of Scripture for that. He forced you to love Him because He first loved you. 
human logic would say, you know, well, you know, if we're the, the children of a king, we've got to do something. I, I heard that for much of my life. I'm sure many of you out there have as well. Where is, where is the verse of Scripture that says, my eternal life, my sonship, my righteousness is based on anything I do. If it is, then it's not a grace. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in this flesh, this, this treasure in, earthen vessel, in an earthen vessel, I live by what? My own works. No, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. Not, it's not even by my faithfulness, but the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That is a life of grace. And our epistle has said, O foolish Galatians, and I can't help but think of that verse, I wonder how much uh, that applies to modern Christianity today. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? I'd like to obey the truth. I, I think any one of you would say you'd, you'd, you'd love to obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. What did that crucifixion in, in, imply? I mean, infer. What did it... I think we make too light of what He did. What He accomplished there. Why did He die? And what did He do when He died? Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit, are you made perfect by the flesh? Are you now made perfect, being made perfect, passive, passive voice, And the Holy Spirit, dearly beloved, the Holy Spirit of God, stop, think, the Holy Spirit of God calls that foolishness. At the moment, we're in uh, you know, about around the 22nd verse of chapter 5, the Holy Spirit has presented a, a powerful, powerful thesis that we are redeemed by the finished work of Jesus Christ and by nothing we do. Nothing. I may have said this every, every, every week from, for the past eight years. Maybe some of you are getting tired of hearing about it, but you are not redeemed because you believe. You're not redeemed because you received. You're not redeemed because you repented. You're not uh, be redeemed because you were baptized or any other thing that you can think of. We're talking about redemption. You are redeemed for one reason, or one reason only. Jesus Christ redeemed you. You didn't ask Him to. You're not redeemed because you asked Him to. You're redeemed because if, if you were not already redeemed, you wouldn't even have the ability to ask Him to. You're redeemed because God paid the price for His own family. That's why you're redeemed. You're a member of His family. If you weren't redeemed, you couldn't believe. If you weren't redeemed, you couldn't receive. And if you weren't redeemed, you couldn't walk with or in the Spirit or by the Spirit. You couldn't walk by the Spirit. And that is the thesis the Holy Spirit has made. Right here. For those of you who care, really care about what this book says, And now we've come to the argument that those Judaizers who have said, I'll call them Judaizers, that's what everybody else does. You know, the, the, the term simply means that a Christian is, is now asked to go back to, go back under the law.
Yeah, I know, yeah, Jesus Christ died for you. But, you know, and, well, it doesn't seem right to offer a sacrifice. That, that, that don't seem right, you know. Ah, I got it. You must be circumcised. So, so they had to pick on something. You know, it didn't seem right if Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain, you know, from uh, the foundation of the world to say, well, you know, that, you know, if you're redeemed, uh, you got to offer, you know, you, you have to offer sacrifice. So they picked on, well, what did make sense to them at the time. You got to be circumcised. Clearly, under the law, God's people were supposed to be circumcised. And so the Holy Spirit, particularly in Romans, we went through that marvelous book at, early on in, in this ministry, where he presents a tremendous argument that that doesn't make any sense because Abraham was called and he wasn't circumcised. Abraham was made righteous and he wasn't circumcised. Circumcised after that, but that's what they picked on. You got to add something to what Christ did. Today, we, we don't pick on circumcision. Normally, people pick on baptism. I think that's, you know, baptism. That, that's what re that replaced circumcision. Normally, baptism, uh, church membership, uh, confession, acceptance, uh, who knows? Who knows what? But something the flesh must do for redemption. And the whole thesis of our present study is that the flesh does nothing for redemption. Nothing. Big fat zero. Nothing. And in our present context, we've looked at the fact that there's a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. We see the same conflict in Romans chapter 7. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what the text says. But that growth is not in righteousness. You're not getting more righteous. Dearly beloved, you're not getting more righteous. If you're getting more righteous, then you are not now the righteousness of, of God in Christ. You who were made sinners by, in Adam, or by Adam, were also made righteous by the obedience of Christ. You're not made righteous by your obedience, but by the obedience of Jesus Christ. You're not, you're not growing in, in righteousness, folks. That is a myth. That's a lie. You're not getting more righteous every day. Sorry. I've got some great news for you. You can't, you can't get any more righteous than what you already are. There, there are not two kinds of Christians. Some who are a little bit righteous, some who are well, more righteous. You know, and then, well, I guess you got three categories. And then there are those who are really super, super duper righteous. You know, all of you who are new creations in Christ Jesus are as righteous as Jesus Christ Himself. He was made sin for you that you might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And that's what you are. And that is not a growth process. You who are now righteous are growing in grace and in knowledge of Him. You're not growing in righteousness. It is, it, it's a fruit and it's perfect. Perfect tense. And the, the fruits of the Spirit are there. They're enumerated. You can read them. <clears throat> Love. 
joy. Folks, that ought to bear you up in every aspect of your life. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't matter what I go through because I'm the child of the King. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. No law. No law. Folks, there's no law against love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. The law was made, get for, guess who? The law was made for sinners. You're not a sinner. Oh, Steve, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. The law was not made for a righteous man. That's what you are. First Timothy. Are you righteous? If you say no, then folks, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you're not redeemed. You can say you're not righteous. God says you are. If you're a new creation in Christ, I don't know whether Christ died in your place or not. I, not, I'm glad I wasn't given, uh, made privy to that information. I do not believe for one moment that you can advance one verse of Scripture that says that He died in every person's place. No. Folks, dearly but listen to me. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Not all, all us all. I was in the Navy. I know this probably doesn't fit to my, my illustration too much, but I, I, I could be in the military, say, for 25, 30 years. I chose not to. Uh, but I, I usually obeyed the Navy. I saluted when I was supposed to. You know, uh, Whatever the captain said, that's what I did. I was, I was taught to obey implicitly. You know, when he said, so, you know, if he had said jump overboard in a pool of sharks, well, there I go. And then I'm discharged. I am now dead to the military. And, and if I ran into my old skipper on the street and he says, you know, shine my, you know, wipe my shoes, shine my shoes, you know, do, do I do that? That's crazy. I'm dead to that. I don't have to do that. I'm foolish to do it. And many Christians don't realize that they're dead to the law. You've died to the law. You're dead to the law. Through Christ. Because you were identified with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 24, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. I am not trying to crucify the flesh. It's a waste of time. I think most Christians are, are really working hard at that. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. When the Scriptures say, reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, you can only reckon that which is true. The word means to count it as, as true. If you weren't dead unto sin, you couldn't reckon it. Where do you get the idea that that verse says that, well, if you don't reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, then you're not dead unto sin. I couldn't reckon I couldn't reckon it if it isn't true. I reckon that that 2 plus 2 is 4. Why? Well, cuz I well I was taught that in grade school. Because 2 2 plus 2 is 4. Well, I'm trying to reckon Pastor Steve. I'm trying to reckon myself dead to sin. 
Now, I really work at that, but it isn't working. And I always say, you got to be kidding. Works for me. And, they, and then they look at me like I'm nuts. Reckoning doesn't stop the sin. It's not why you reckon. You, you reckon because you can't stop the sin. What God says is counted as true. The fact that you are dead to sin. You couldn't reckon it if it isn't true. Romans 6.11 Your present state as a Christian, whether you want to believe it or not, accept it or not, is you're dead to sin. Pastor, I don't believe it. Fine. Well, that's fine. Your argument's with God, not me. If you're not dead to sin, you're not a child of God. You died with Christ. You were buried with Christ. And you rose with Christ. Therefore, your flesh is crucified with Christ. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. Okay? That's our text in verse 24. You're going to crucify yourself? Yeah. Put yourself to death? Folks, self-crucifixion self is a pretty difficult way to commit suicide. Essentially, it's impossible. You, you, you didn't crucify yourself. You're not crucifying yourself. Flesh was crucified because you were intimately identified with Christ in His death. You know, when we went several years back, when we went through Romans, I tried to point out when Jesus Christ was on the cross, your name was there. My name was there. He knew everyone intimately in whose place He was dying. We died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. And we rose with Christ. The... How often do you hear that even talked about today? It's a marvelous truth. We walk by grace. It's astounding how much modern Christianity just obscures it. I sat in this, uh, this youth class years ago. I think it was back in the 90s. The pastor said, now I want to go around. I want to find out when, when you were saved. And everybody around there, you know, they knew when they were, they were saved. One guy even told me he was saved on his commode, on his toilet, you know. Everybody knew when they were saved, except me. And he got to me, I, I said, well, before the foundation of the world, and they wanted to throw me out of the class. I think it's wonderful that I was redeemed in Jesus Christ before God ever laid the foundation of this world. Revelation. You know, he died before the foundation of the world. I was intimately identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And if you are his, so were you. It's an arrest, it's a state of being. It is a state of being, it isn't something being done. Your present state as a Christian today is crucified with Christ in order that the body of the sin of, of the sin might be destroyed and we no longer serve sin. And dearly beloved, those are marvelous truths of grace. Grace. You can't really study any verse of this book and not see the marvelous truth of the grace of God. He that is dead is freed from sin. How many Christians do you know that rejoice in the fact that they are forever freed from sin? None of those verses say that you aren't sinning. It's ridiculous to be freed from sin if there isn't any sin. I mean, what, what are you freed from? 
Well, I, I have great news for you. I'm freed from the Martians. I, I mean, if there aren't any Martians, well, what does that mean? Well, it, of course there's sin, but you're free from it. You're dead to it. Is that the way that you rejoice in your walk in grace? These are Romans 6 verses. If we be dead with Christ, then we believe that we also shall live with Him. If we died with Him and were buried with Him, then we rose with Him. We rose with Him. How often do you hear that? That when Christ rose from the dead, we rose with Him. How, much, how often do you hear that? And yet that is a bedrock truth of Scripture. Much more than being redeemed or reconciled by the death of Christ, we shall be saved by His life because we rose with Him and we live with Him. Our deliverance is in the life of Christ. Our redemption is in the death of Christ. I'll be saved by His life. Because He lives, I'll be delivered. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Marvelous, marvelous truth. Oh, foolish Galatians! Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by your own performance, your own works, the flesh? The works of the flesh. Is that how you're becoming more mature in Christ? No, no, no. A thousand times, no. You died with Christ. This is not a command of something that you ought to do. This is a marvelous revelation of grace that it's something done. Christians have crucified the Steve, I got to crucify the flesh. You have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. And again, it's an aorist tense. They're, they're, they are not doing it. It isn't something that they should do. It's not something that you should do. It isn't a command. It isn't uh, an imperfect. It's not a future. It's not a... It's not a perfect. It's simply a state of being. If you are Christ, if you belong to Him, you have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. If that is not true, then you are not His. It, folks, it's just that simple. It's just that simple. You live by grace, not by law. That's how you live and function around this terrible turned upside down, upside down place. Grace is probably the most trampled word in modern Christianity. If you're Christ, if you belong to Him, you died with Him, you were buried with Him, and you rose with Him, praise God, sin shall not have dominion over you. The motivation that drives your life is love, folks, not law. It's the whole basis of the epistle. It's not law. It's law. Well, I was absolutely certain I'd finish this chapter today. But I didn't make it. Well, we'll do that uh, next week, Lord willing. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have, the grand opportunity that you've given us to fellowship together in the, in the, the grand truth of your word. Oh, Father, that you loved us, bought us, redeemed us, and made us the righteousness of God in Christ. 
May that truth, may these truths grip our hearts that our love for you be the drive of our life. Strip away that which was said here that was foolish, ignorant, which is not in agreement with your word, but open hearts and minds to the grand truths of grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you all as we await Him. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.